Hello, my name is Ari Redboard, Head of Legal and Government Affairs at TRM Labs. Welcome to TRM Talks. TRM Talks is brought to you by TRM Labs, the leading provider of blockchain intelligence and anti-money laundering software. Singapore, its harbor protected by the impressive Merlion, touts the world's busiest container transshipment port, a symbol of a nation forged by its key role in global cross-border commerce. So is it really any surprise that the Lion City has roared when it comes to building a new financial system characterized by cross-border payments and facilitating global commerce? Singapore and its financial regula re regulator, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, MAS, has led when it comes to crafting thoughtful regulation while understanding the importance of not stifling game-changing innovation. So today I'm joined by those at the forefront of crafting, interpreting, and understanding the regulation in Singapore. Tan Shi Min, Deputy Director and Head of Payments Policy Division, Monetary Authority of Singapore. John Ho, Global Head of Legal Financial Markets at Standard Chartered Bank. And Grace Chung, former regulator and now Head of Financial Regulatory in Singapore for Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher. Thank you all so much uh, for joining today. This is literally the dream panel uh, to discuss this topic. Uh, so really, really extraordinary to have, you know, financial institution, uh, lawyer, former regulator, and obviously uh, current regulator is really, really extraordinary. Um, so thank you all so much for joining me. Before we, uh, before we dig into sort of the state of, of crypto regulation in, in Singapore, we'd love to get to know you uh, a, a little bit better if we can sort of kick things off by maybe starting to talk about little, your journey to your current roles, a little bit about what you're doing and really your sort of journey to, to cryptocurrency. Um, Chi, maybe I'll uh, kick things off with you. Okay, uh, thank you, Ari and TRM Lab for the invitation. And I'm really glad it's a pleasure really to be on this panel with uh, Grace and John who are clearly experts in this space. Um, I mean, I have to say, if you talk about like my journey, or if you talk about how I stumble into digital asset, cryptocurrency, when I think back, I have to say it's probably when my dad asked me what's a Bitcoin like four years ago and asked me whether, you know, he should be buying it. That, that probably kickstarts my first memory of Bitcoin. And then thereafter, I, even, I remember I bought a book on basics of Bitcoin and blockchain by Anthony Lewis after that. So they kind of like, you know, how I started looking into this space at a personal level. And then of course, um, in MES, before I was in this role, um, I was in the department that sort of look at banking policies. And um, we were looking at Libra at that time. There was a lot of curiosity, a lot of questions amongst the regulators on what um, Libra could mean um, for, uh, for, for, um, for really the whole payment space on how or even like what bank means, right? So that was also like, you know, like before I joined this role, uh, something, something that was quite topical at the time. And then of course, um, I joined the payments department when it was uh, set up two years ago. And that was the time when the Payment Services Act took effect. Um, and I guess here I am today, I'm plunging into this space now. I think the other thing you mentioned that's really interesting is um, is Libra. And uh, I, I was a treasury um, when Libra launched, and I think it really became uh, a watershed for so many regulators globally um, in trying to sort of get their hands around or really understand sort of what it meant for, you know, potentially hundreds of billions of users to have access to, um, you know, a, a fiat backed stable coin. And, you know, it was really the first time regulators ever spoke about stable coins at all. And look where we are today, right? Where mm. regulators won't stop talking mm. about stable coins. So it's really, it's, it's really, it, I, I relate to that uh, experience, you know, quite a bit. Uh, great, yeah. great same question. We'd love to kind of hear, hear about your journey, um, you know, in, in your current role and, and, and how you found yourself in this space. Yeah, thanks so much for the invite. And I really appreciate having the opportunity to be here with Shimin as well, you know, that, that we, we meet so much across the space and, and John again. Um, and, and I started off uh, really about six years ago in Hong Kong uh, when I was in private practice. And, you know, there's a little point which crosses over with Shimin because I remember in my very first blockchain conference in Hong Kong, this was in Cyberport. Um, I was there with 17 other people um, in this 
in my first blockchain conference. And one of them was Anthony Lewis. You know, I don't know whether he's, he's, at, he's attending today's session. Uh, but at that time, the blockchain scene was quite nascent. He's now in Singapore, actually. Um, and at that time, in 2016, I had started off advising some um, emerging tech fin players um, on the setup of digital asset platforms. My first exchange then, then in, back in 2016, uh, robo-advisory platforms, uh, corporate acquisition and compliance support. And I think to today, uh, you know, I think the, the, the scene has really quite exploded. Um, I've moved over to Singapore and continue supporting uh, the digital assets place, uh, space. And we now support quite a, a large number of, um, you know, over 40 um, focused digital assets players in this space with and, and focus very much on regional regulatory reform initiatives as well and participate in discussions with different regulators on behalf of the digital assets industry, including the MES as well as the Hong Kong SFC and other global regulators. So I think it's really an evolving and a very exciting space. I learn a lot uh, from people like Shunmin, from people like John, you know, John and his, you know, very helpful guidance and thoughts on stable coins and different topics. And, you know, it's just uh, an, an area which I feel very fortunate to be a part of as well yeah no grace thank you so much for that and, and uh and john before i get to you i'm going to embarrass you a little bit you know when i when i first got to trm uh after years in the government you know I, i'd say i looked around the space for people to sort of reach out to to just learn from and i'd say i was at trm for about two weeks before i reached out to john and uh he was nice enough to have conversations with me at all hours because you know based <laughs> on the time, the time differences but uh just re really appreciate um uh, that and certainly and and John, talk talk a little bit about how you sort of are where you are now in terms of this space, um, and, and really sort of how you got into it in your journey. Yeah, thanks, Harry, and, and thanks, TRM Labs, for inviting us to to share our experience and insight. I think my journey started uh, in earnest uh, when we, as a bank, uh, submitted and participated in the UK Financial Conduct Authority sandbox and cohort five, where we had a proposal on what we call a tokenized deposit. So there was a, a sort of problem statement that we wanted to try on the sandbox to look at whether that itself uh, would be treated a, as a banking product as opposed to a financial instrument. So it was a, a proof of concept um, sandbox that we did and tested with an app. Um, there was a real blockchain that we had to, to do from end to end uh, in a sort of test environment for about nine months. So that sort of provide that catalyst for us to do a number of proof of concepts in terms of bond tokenization, asset tokenization, blockchain bridge, and, and that led uh, sort of sort of uh, the institution to do a number of initiatives that we sort of led to where we are today. And I think as, as well, uh, I've been also fortunate to, to sort of been involved in the industry uh, on a number of fronts with trade associations like ISDA, the FIA, uh, and also with, with some of the trade association. Um, I'm currently the sort of the FCA uh, mentor for the digital sandbox and a mentor for the tech sustainability tech sprint. Um, and th just yesterday, we participated in the UK FCA crypto sprint to look at, um, you know, problem statement and come out with, you know, potential suggestions uh, for consideration. So um, currently also the mentor for R3 and Longhash, which are both blockchain incubating network. And the reason why that's important is I think as financial institutions get more involved in this space, it's important to know what are sort of problem statements, what are sort of initiatives out there that you know there could be potential areas of collaboration and also are there any uh sort of initiative where both institution as well as the fintech firms could collaborate thanks sorry no absolutely thank you uh you know they say crypto never sleeps i think either does john um you know, apparently <laughs> it's it's amazing uh great grace uh would you sort of kick mm -hmm. us off you know you uh you have this really unique uh background mm -hmm. in terms of sort of being a regulator and now representing clients um, you know, as to sort of their regulatory obligations. Um, would you sort of level set a little bit for us by providing kind of an overview of the crypto regulatory landscape in Singapore before we sort of dive into each of these specific areas? Mm -hmm. I hope I can do it justice because after all, Shimin is, is, is here as well. So um, we, have, yeah. we have been, yeah, so we have been following the path of uh, crypto regulations um, in Singapore, which has evolved, of course, over the years. Um, and the initial focus of the PS Act, uh, the Payment Services Act, um, the origin, of course, which, which started in 2017, was actually more a focus on um, anti-money laundering at that time uh, because, uh, you know, virtual currency transactions in 2017, given their 
anonymous nature was uh, regarded as particularly uh, vulnerable to you know money laundering and terrorist financing risk. And MAS had at that time had been very keen to introduce you know AML CFT requirements to be imposed uh, on virtual currency intermediaries that deal or facilitate the exchange of vir uh, virtual currencies for real currencies. But um, since that time, I think we have moved on quite a bit uh, because, you know, really we have moved on to other types of risks in this space and other types of needs, uh, growing risks in this space. And over the years, we have seen that the MES has moved on to address also technology and cyber risks, um, consumer protection, uh, as well as financial stability um, as other key areas which the MES has focused on. Um, so it is also important to note that uh, for emerging players that we have highlighted that there are new uh, regulated activities to be introduced by the Payment Services um, Amendment Act, uh, which are also largely mirrored in the Financial Services and Markets Act, uh, which we won't belabor here, but um, you know, safe to say it includes safeguarding as well as other activities, um, as well as new compliance and other obligations to be introduced, uh, possibly new user protection requirements as well, uh, which will have important implications on entities operating both uh, in or from Singapore um, as well as on an extraterritorial basis, offering services um, into Singapore. So often, um, you know, as a global firm, uh, we, the kind of questions we get are often on a cross-border basis, uh, which means that entities often think about, you know, offering services across many different jurisdictions. And so uh, they are often keen to um, think about how they can implement something which is consistent in terms of their approach and how they respond on a consistent level in developing policies and procedures as well. Yeah. Terrific. Yeah, no, thank you so much for that, that overview. Shimin, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, go to you now. Um, on issue that's sort of really top of mind for everyone, we mentioned Libra, we mentioned, you know, stable coins are really the, the, the focus of so many regulators globally. The New York Department of Financial Services just this week came out with very concise, clear guidance for what it, that its expectation is going to be for stable coin issuers that are licensed by that entity. Um, how, how is MAS thinking about stable coins, um, particularly in the wake of the Terra collapse? Uh, this is a question that we probably get at almost every crypto forum or every meetings um, regarding this topic. Uh, particularly in the last few weeks, I think when you go everywhere, we are all talking about Terra. So, uh, but it, obviously it is um, a very important, uh, important question because, um, uh, you know, we have been thinking about stable coins actually even before our Payment Services, services Act even commenced. Um, we put out a consultation paper back in December 2019. Um, so it was actually um, in our mind knowing that this unique creature probably could not fit very neatly to what I have set out under the Payment Services Act today. Um, it's not an easy issue to deal with because um, the form of it just resembles different aspects of um, the traditional financial services that we are um, most familiar with. So stablecoin issuers, some will say that they look like banks because they take money and then they promise redeemability, but they don't intermediate credit, right? So which is the core function of being a bank. Um, some of them also refer to them like they look like money market funds, but they are also different because of, uh, you know, the rights to the underlying assets, etc. cetera. So today, how we um, regulate um, uh, stable coins in Singapore, and Grace actually knows this very well, and she gave a very good overview, is that uh, we have this um, uh, uh, this service we call Digital Payment Token Services under the Payment Services Act, which we regulate all the cryptocurrency-related services that she mentioned earlier. So at this point, we are um, treating all types of stable coins no differently from other cryptocurrencies, meaning they will consider them as digital payment tokens in, in, in this sense. Um, this is really based on how we see stable coins are being used and being exchanged today, largely to facilitate crypto trades. And the fact that um, there are certain uh, price volatilities, and of course, the range of price volatilities will differ depending on what type of coin. Um, but there are these uh, price volatilities in the secondary market, even though the issuance, um, uh, at the point of issuance, it may. Uh, be claimed to be packed, for instance, one to one US dollar, etc. So, so this regulatory treatment really means that um, 
uh, what the service provider, um, uh, we bring them into our regulatory ambit, but what they focus on is really uh, addressing money laundering and terrorism financing risk, as um, Grace has mentioned, tech risk. Um, there is currently no uh, particular user protection measures like safeguarding, etc. We, we are not putting any of these requirements in place today. There are only typical risk warnings. So this is like similar to cryptocurrency. So this is what we have today. But clearly, you know, we have to review this and we are reviewing this. Um, and um, how we look at it is really in the context of how we envisage stablecoin to potentially play a role in the future of financial services. So we are not pursuing stablecoin for the novelty of it. Right? It has to mean something in the future of financial services. So today, they are still largely being used in the crypto ecosystem, trading with other cryptocurrencies. Uh, we are starting to um, observe some real-world human use cases. We have seen um, even like likes of Visa, MasterCard, etc. They are also adopting more of this. So it's worth digging um, deep into understanding whether and how they can improve payments. Uh, so the, I would say that the Terra Luna episode sort of um, um, globally, what we see is that it led to a renewed call for regulations for stable coins. Uh, in fact, we have seen um, this week uh, two jurisdictions which has come up with uh, some certainty in how they intend to uh, do it. So um, I, I think some market analysts call it like the Goldilocks moment, right? When, when uh, the Terra Luna episode actually happened. Um, and how we actually see it internally is that uh, it is a good test for regulators, for ourselves to consider what are the issues that matter and what are the issues that should be addressed. Um, because you can't put all the, all the measures that you can possibly think of on this at this point, because otherwise we probably will kill it before they even take off. Um, but I'll just kind of like cover three points that uh, we are most concerned or looking at closely. One is, of course, financial stability. Is at the top of our mind how spillover effects could materialize in the um, broader financial system when there is a run in stablecoin, uh, especially if uh, it is potentially a widely used one in the future, right? And um, it could be either because the stablecoin had to unwind very quickly the underlying financial assets to defend the pack, or it could be from financial institutions' exposure to crypto assets generally. And then the second um, area that we are looking at is actually really the promise of stability in value by stablecoin issuers, right? Because at the end, this is really the crux of whether it can become and it can function as a means of payment. Um, the regulatory levers that you see out there by regulators who have thrown out um, consultation papers and legislation is really things like whether you require redemption at par, whether you require um, the reserves to be fully backed by certain type of assets, right? So the, these are the levers. Um, but to us, before we can even decide what we what levers we want to put in place, um, the the recent episode really accentuated in internal discussions on what are the potential attributes or prerequisites of um, real stablecoin for the lack of better reference uh, that can truly have a shot at becoming um, somewhat money like to function right as payments so it's not because again we need another currency but really because um, uh, of how it could potentially be a settlement asset to improve payments especially on cross-border basis and um and the crux of it is really by it leveraging on a blockchain and dlt so having a good sense of you know what are the possible prerequisites or attributes could then help us drive regulatory policies to steer development towards that. But I think I will add the third point, which to us is very important, is that um, we know that stable coins, um, the form of it we see today could operate at an international level, global level, right? So international consistency in regulatory approach actually matters a lot because of the nature of how it works. So there is a lot of discussion at international regulatory forums and we actively participate in all of them. Um, it is important to do so to have all these dialogues and um, not only amongst regulators, and I would say with industry players as well, they, there is the need to actively engage on both fronts so, it, so that there's a common understanding and direction going forward on the international level. Yeah, so these are some, some thoughts. I don't really uh, give you a lot of answers. I probably throw more questions than anything, but uh, these are really flavor of what we are thinking through. I, I thought that was amazing. And there were, so, there were in fact, so many answers there um, and so many really important points. Um, 
that was one of the best answers I think I've heard on stable coins, to be honest with you. But I think really sort of uh, one thing that you made very clear is one, uh, MAS, you are thinking about how to ensure sound regulation without, uh, you know, stepping over that line into that stifling of innovation, which I think is so important. And you mentioned that specifically, but then also the global solution, right? I mean, uh, this is not, you know, MAS cannot solve this. You know, uh, you know, U.S. financial regulators, U.K. financial regulators cannot solve this. It really has to be because it doesn't matter what only one regulator says in the world on this topic. And it's really I think it's really uh, it, a really, really good point. Um, John, you've written and thought a lot about sort of financial stability related issues. Obviously, that's first and foremost when you're talking about stable coins today. Um, any sort of points, additional points to add to uh, Shimin's comments? Yeah, just just to add to what Shimin's comments, what we've seen in the uh, sort of the sort of aftermath of, of Terra and Luna and also um, the volatility in some of these stable coins, as you know, uh, not all of them uh, had maintained a pack at all times. And that sort of uh, accentuate the problem that uh, not all stable coins are the same and not all of stable coins do maintain value at all times. So in the case of a bang, uh, sort of a bang will run event, that's what we see type event, you could actually see uh, that, you know, this uh, systemically important stable coins could pose potentially in future, if they still continue to grow, potential risk to the systemic uh, sort of wider, you know, uh, system, because as, as a percentage of, of crypto to, let's say, the um, financial system, I think the BIF, as I said, is still quite small. But I think if you, let's say, project this a couple of years, if, if this growth in, in digital assets continues to grow such that financial institution, institutional players get involved, it becomes a systemic issue. I think important to, on the back of the financial stability issue, is also ensure, you know, the standards that we are used to in financial institution like transparency, market integrity, uh, best, you know, best conduct rules, uh, best, you know, all these things need to be brought to fore. What do I mean by that is currently there's a lack of a consistent approach towards the, even the taxonomy or definitions of, of various types of, of uh, digital assets, in particular, also the various types of stable coins. Now, obviously, it's, you know, there are not just one type of stable coins. You have the fiat-backed stable coins, you've got asset-backed stable coins, you got the algorithmic stable coins, and you also have a mixed back of what we call a hybrid, where it is a combination of either uh, backed by crypto assets or backed by uh, commodities or backed by combinations of, of various assets we can see. And obviously, these comes with new uh, emerging and idiosyncratic risks that one needs to really consider from a risk management perspective, resilience, uh, financial stability, and, 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 and uh, you know, risk management. I think the other thing that's important, uh, if given a cross-border nature, cross nature of, of stablecoins, is for the private and public sector to get together to sort of create a effective regulatory framework that, that fits the purpose in the long run. I think that hopefully will instill consumer confidence to promote investor protection, as I mentioned, as well as to support innovation in, in this area as well. So, the stablecoin activity should be regulated on, a, I believe, on a risk-based approach, uh, looking at the activity rather than looking at the entity. As you know, uh, the, the sort of traditional approach is to regulate entity. But these days, uh, different forms and entity, especially those that are not regulated as credit institution or institu uh, banks, are able to con conduct financial services, especially in the decentralized finance, uh, without being regulated or without being subject to the same prudential capital and regulation, I think it's key to ensure that there is a same level playing field to the extent that it involves consumer, investor. Uh, and I think that that's key for the long-term uh, sustainability of, of this approach. And I think given that we're, we're, we're talking about uh, where to develop in just this week, we have seen the New York DFS coming out with stable core guidance. Uh, last week, we have seen the uh, UK HMT uh, coming out with a proposal uh, to regulate systemically important stable coins. And I think even in Japan, uh, just a couple of days ago, they have enshrined investor protection rules in respect to uh, stable coins that are issued or targeting retail, i.e. enshrining investor protection such that um, the issuer of the stable coin needs to be regulated, you know, akin to an e-money issuer for which the convertibility and redemption, at least at par, is enshrined, is enshrined given that 
you need to make sure that the uh, reserve requirements and the transparency requirements are met. So what we're going to see now increasingly uh, is greater collaboration among uh, the uh, G7 or G10 countries to look at coming out with a, a global uh, sort of a consistent framework. Just last week, the G7 came out with a communication on, on stable coins as well, in particular on digital assets. I, I would like to quote what, what they say. They say that the G7 call upon regulators and international standard setters uh, to focus on the development and implementation of a consistent and a comprehensive regulation on crypto asset issuers and service provider with a view to holding crypto assets, including stable coins, to the same standard as the rest of the financial system. So what we're going to see is not less regulations. In fact, uh, to the extent that uh, it involves the mass retail public and you know, institutional money, we're going to see uh, you know, the raising of bar to the standards of what we normally see in the financial markets. John, John, thank you so much for that. And there are some really terrific questions on stable coins, not surprisingly, in the chat. Um, I think I'm going to table those for a moment because we have so many other important issues. I think we should have done a stable coin regulation in Singapore as the title for this, because <laughs> I think that's what people want to talk about right now. But we'll, we'll get to those in a moment. Um, Grace, I'm going to ask you sort of about my, my favorite topic, you know, anti-money laundering, uh, terrorist financing related issues. Um, can you talk a little bit about how Singapore has really led in that space uh, in terms of regulation? What do the regulations look like today? Sure, Harry. So I think this is also similarly like stable coins, a whole topic in itself as well. Yeah, so totally. I'll try to yeah. be brief here. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think an important point to note is that um, I think um, quite a lot of entities that I speak to, they always focus, of course, on the main AML notices and guidelines, which are applicable to license uh, or exam entities, such as the PSN02, for, um, uh, which is the main uh, digital payment token service AML notice. But actually, I'll, I'll start off with the general laws and regulations that are applicable for all entities and persons, which actually comes in the form of the Corruption, Drug Trafficking and Other Serious Crimes Act, um, as well as the Terrorism Suppression of Financing Act, which addresses uh, the prevention of money laundering and, and its criminalization. So overall, there are actually general principles in relation to you know the filing of STRs, general principles against um, you know, uh, the, um, for the reporting of SDR, uh, the reporting of money laundering, I mean, and terrorist financing, uh, which are set in um, Singapore's legislation. Um, and when you come to licensed or regulated entities, there are then different note, uh, different types of notices and guidelines, depending on the type of entity you are. Um, so for payment services entities, of course, um, they would fall within the scope of the Payment Services Act. Um, if you are a recognized market operator or a security token operator or a type of um, entity which falls within the scope of a Securities and Futures Act, you would then fall within the notices and guidelines that are associated with that. So in general, what we have seen is that um, the AML guidance and notice which has been issued by the MES um, has been um, aligned to uh, FEDF Financial Action Task Force recommendations and interpretation notes. Um, including in relation to the travel rule requirements, which is much uh, talked about in the industry. Um, and, and so um, I think the, the travel rule requirements, I won't belabor that because I think they are actually quite widely known um, in the industry. Um, and, and they come in the form of Section um, 13 of the notice PSN02 in the case of the Payment Services Act. And uh, we know often with um, a lot of the firms we work with, um, some of them remark that they are some of the most extensive um, in Singapore compared to many other jurisdictions globally um, um, in terms of uh, the requirements which um, uh, pertain to the sharing of information between um, 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 both parties, um, between the exchanges as well as the parties which are sending out the recipients and the beneficiaries as well. So um, in terms of the AML obligations which apply, um, of course, you're thinking about the basic um, due diligence requirements that you must collect, but also when it comes to politically um, exposed persons, there are then um, deep, a deeper level of um, information is required with regard to source of funds, verification of information, and a risk assessment is required in terms of an enterprise-wide risk assessment um, in terms of the kind of customers you are taking on. And the MES has considered um, a lot of um, you know, specific 
um, types of practical guidance when it comes to digital assets. So they have produced actually quite a lot of uh, red flags and practical guidance and input in the forms of guidelines um, in relation to players. But of course, when we do um, service a lot of our clients, we do get in, into very interesting discussions actually on a very practical basis in terms of you know um, how do you um, KYC or set up practical uh, checks verification checks um, in terms of sanctions issues when you had the whole Russian you know Ukraine um, sanctions issues how do you resolve and and how do you uh, risk assess or um, you know um, um, align your uh, policies and procedures with regulatory expectations um, especially for firms that actually operate on a global level these are actually very challenging issues Issues, um, especially when you're operating on a global level and you have to satisfy the requirements of many regulators. Um, I think these are all very interesting issues that you have to um, you know, deal with um, with your regulators as well as um, dealing with your notification requirements. What we saw in MES, um, in the case of MES in Singapore, was that the MES actually issued quite a number of uh, circulars and reminders to the industry to note their um, uh, obligations in terms of sanctions, in terms of um, the, the need to actually carry out uh, trans transaction screening and reviews. And we saw actually the MES having um, very detailed conversations with a lot of the licensed entities as well as the, those pursuing um, an application with the MES for under the Payment Services Act um, in terms of how uh, whether they had any Russian corridor exposure, for instance, uh, or in terms of whether they had any uh, sanctioned entity exposure and how they were dealing with such participants, whether they had um, off-boarded any uh, particular entities, how they were dealing with um, reporting and policies and procedures associated with that. So I think these have all been, you know, issues which are, um, of course, a lot more challenging. I think it's really quite a unprecedented kind of um, era. I think when we talk with a lot of our asset managers as well, it's really an era where you're dealing with a lot of new politics, given the new China-US uh, scenario as well, a lot of new entities added into this space. So I think we are, um, you know, really it's an evolving era where entities do have to think a lot about how they are setting up their systems, thinking about outsourcing, thinking about oversight over the entities, which they um, assign a lot of the first level screening as well. And I think all this is quite uh, important for entities to manage. Yeah. Terrific, Anna. Thank you so much. And you always advise your clients to use TRM for transaction monitoring to make sure that they're uh, not engaging with those sanctioned entities, right? And of course, I, rem I, 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 of course I always remind them that Ari is also, you know, the expert in this space. I'm just, I'm just, He's available 24-7 to call me on all Call me whenever you want. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, in, in all seriousness, you did raise a really great point, and that is, great regulators. I think we think about regulators with enforcement actions, we think about licensing, but we don't think of that about that engagement with their regulated entities, with that private sector. And I think great regulators are constantly pushing out guidance, constantly pushing out advisories to help the private sector kind of understand what their obligations are. Um, Shimin, I, 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 uh, I think we, we're, we are kind of getting to that, that idea of sort of licensing, right? And um, you know, licensing in some respects, other than enforcement actions, are, are the way that regulators ensure that their, uh, you know, regulated entities are doing what they're supposed to do, right? Sort of having that ability to license or pull a license. Uh, would you talk a little bit about sort of the licensing process, um, you know, for uh, MAS and how you're thinking about sort of fulfilling those obligations? Uh, yeah, so... Uh... Under the Payment Services Act, uh, we have the activity-based regime. It means that if you perform any of the um, regulated payment service that we list there, um, you would have to get a license. So in the case of uh, digital payment token services, um, if you meet any of those uh, activities uh, relating to digital payment services, you are providing them um, in Singapore, you would have to apply for a license. And um, depending on the size of the business projected, that entity can also be either a, a, a try to apply for a standard payment institution license or a major payment institution license. So we have these two classes available. Um, interested entities, I would say, uh, should first look at whether uh, they would be able to meet our admission criteria before they send in um, an application, really because um, the admission criteria 
do states. I mean, of course, the easiest is probably looking at whether you have, have you are able to meet the minimum base capital. Um, we also listed out things like fitness and proprietary of the controllers and directors. Um, you know, some of the setup, having a robust business uh, proposal. And, um, and as you go through this, I think the very important thing before you officially apply is really making sure that you understand the um, obligations and requirements under the Act and Notices. And um, as Grace has very nicely summarized earlier, money laundering and uh, terrorism financing risk is something that is, our, is the key area that we will look out for when we look at um, li uh, license applications, when we review a uh, license application. And uh, I would say that we look for players who uh, demonstrates clear understanding and also demonstrate ability to be able to address all this risk, as well as technology risk, which are posed by their specific business model. So this is very important because this is about uh, commensurating you know, what you do and what the risk po that is uh, in posed by your business model. You have to demonstrate that clear understanding. And then correspondingly also, how are the controls in place to mitigate this risk? Um, so uh, once you know you get a good sense, you probably can get advice from Grace and then um, you can submit uh, an, a license application. Of course, there will be a usual process of uh, interviews, follow up uh, questions. Um, and I, I say it's a rigorous process. I, it is deliberate. So and we have to do that because um, uh, at the end of the day, we want to build a responsible ecosystem, an ecosystem that can play a very strong role in our overall international financial center. Um, so we only approve applicants with um, strong governance structure uh, that are fit and proper in terms of their board and management. Um, importantly, robust compliance framework. And uh, lastly, uh, credible track records. So these are um, really some of the key things that we look out for that I can share. Uh, so if there are interested applicants out there, um, try to see if you can check the boxes and uh, we welcome you to apply online. That That's fantastic. And and and, um, and I ask Grace for advice, um, which I'm gonna do right now. I'm gonna ask Grace for advice on, uh, on another topic here. Uh, uh, consumer protection is obviously a huge focus uh, for MAS and really uh, regulators globally. Um, and, and Shimin, feel free to jump in here also in terms of how MAS today is thinking about consumer protection related issues. But Grace, if you can sort of talk about the framework for consumer protection in Singapore, um, you know, kind of get us started there. Yeah. So actually, um, I, I, when I was looking at this question, I thought that perhaps I'll just flag one of the key initiatives that MAS has issued in this regard, uh, which is actually advertising guidelines that MAS um, issued in January 2022 uh, to digital asset service providers with regard to the way they promote their service offerings to the general public. And we noted that um, this followed after developments, for example, in the UK and other jurisdictions as well. And the new guidelines um, serve to clarify MAS's expectations um, on DPT service providers advertising and the expectations that DPT service providers um, should not portray the trading of DPTs in a manner that trivializes the high risk of trading in DPTs, um, nor should they um, engage in marketing activities that target the general public. So um, in view of the MAS's concerns, um, I think what the industry has tried to do, um, so for example, uh, we uh, uh, um, the, the one of the industry associations that I work with is the Blockchain Association Access, uh, but we have also worked together with the other fintech associations, um, the Singapore Fintech Association, as well as the Blockchain Association of Singapore. Uh, we have been working together with Shimin, um, as well as you know others in the MAS regarding these guidelines. And um, our firm, um, Gibson Dunn, we are currently um, coordinating an um, access working group um, um, to draft a code of practice essentially um, on, the, on the advertising guidelines and we are also um, access is also taking in input uh, from the SFA, the BAS as well as Crypto UK because Crypto UK is also doing a response to their regulator on their advertising guidelines and we, we hope to be able to work together with MES to um, develop clarifications and guidelines on this very important topic for the digital assets industry um, uh, specifically exactly um, addressing this point of uh, really thinking about consumer and investor protection um, from this aspect of advertising guidelines. It, it is so interesting. You know, I want to say it was within one week 
that the UK, Singapore, I want to say maybe Ireland, Spain, a whole bunch of regulators globally came out with these advertising. Spain, uh, yeah. Spain, right, advertising related uh regulation is those like really interesting they were slightly different but really felt very very similar uh she any you know i don't you don't even need to ask, answer that one but just any any additional sort of thoughts on the consumer protection sort of advertising piece <laughs> <laughs> i would say that i promise we did not coordinate and we did not agree <laughs> that we would issue like two days after each other uh yeah. it just happened to be so uh, but I guess um, it definitely reflects um, the common uh, concern that uh, regulators have as the industry increasingly um, you know, uh, gets um, uh, extend their reach. We see more and more players becoming licensed and um, you see a lot more coverage on um, developments in cryptocurrency. So it is inevitable that uh, you would then see uh, more um, consumers being curious, like people like my dad who would want to invest in it. Um, so, yeah. but we are concerned, uh, really, because um, uh, the th the thing is, um, uh, our primary concern is really that uh, individual consumers might be swayed by social media influencers, uh, by the headlines that they see, and they think that it's an easy way to make profits, um, and they just go into it, right? So, we, so we have made very clear and I would say possibly strong statement to say retail investors should steer clear from trading in cryptocurrencies um, really because of the sharp speculative swings that, that we see and we really think it's highly risky for consumers to just go into the, it like that. Um, um, and we have uh, issued um, advisories, we run financial education campaigns actually for many years even before the Payment Services Act uh, took place when Bitcoin was a hot thing. We, we have run campaigns for many years now. So as what Grace said in January this year, um, we decided to issue uh, guidelines to the industry. So this is really telling the industry that uh, we uh, that they should not be advertising their services to the general public in Singapore. And I'm talking about doing it in our subway stations, in the bus stops, in the cinemas, uh, which are um, actually... Uh, starting to take place quite widely in Singapore uh, during uh, before we had the guidelines. And um, it goes against our view and our policy stance in this aspect. So we felt a need to give the clarity to the industry on our expectations on this front. Um, the issue of uh, consumer protection remains on our watch list. Um, like uh, many uh, regulators globally, we continue to review to see if um, there might be... Um, different types of uh, user protection measures that might be suitable and needed, uh, particularly for the retail market. Of course, we get uh, very good inputs from the industry as well, Grace, and then with the um, associations in Singapore, they give inputs to us as well on what they think uh, could be useful measures to um, align the industry practices. So all these are really something that we are actively uh, are looking at. Um, but I, I guess I want to also put things in perspective because I think when we came up with the guidelines, there was um, quite um, a lot of feedback. But the perspective is that so how MES sees uh, cryptocurrency is that it's a sliver of the broader digital asset ecosystem. And um, really the bigger vision when we look at the whole ecosystem that MES is trying to build is really how the underlying technology, the blockchain technology itself, can be um, a transformative uh, technology to build a better future of finance and to build a smart uh, financial center through innovation on this front. So, you know, like, so there, there is actually that tension over there as we move along with the industry to develop this. But um, yeah, so we, we, we definitely continue to partner with the industry and how we uh, develop on this front. Shimin, I think that really dovetails really nicely into another question I want to ask you, but I'm going to hold hold it for one second because I want to ask John a question from the chat um, because I know this is like 100% your sweet spot. So Christopher L. asks, how do we see the role of private sector stable coins coexisting with government-backed CBDCs? Is there a level playing field whereby central banks being the issuer of CBDC may, may create unfair entry barriers for stable coins? It's that dynamic between CBDCs Stable coins, private cryptocurrencies that I feel like you you've given a lot of a lot of thought to written written about quite frequently. Yeah, thanks, Ari. 
I think this, this question has been posed to central banks a lot. Uh, I think in recent days, there's a lot of central banks giving their views. But I think in short, now, the what the regulators want to do is respect well-designed and obviously regulated types of, of stable coins uh, with proper guardrails. I think they do welcome the, the sort of diversity in terms of uh, different types of tokens that to play different roles. Because as we said, that the when you have a an introduction of, of a central bank digital currency in any in a major jurisdiction, at this point, it is still Jewish that are out there whether they can cover the whole spectrum of payment scenarios. And I think what uh, is important to note is in, in terms of interest of fair competition, giving a consumer a you know, choices, I think it's key to make sure that there are uh, sufficient uh, options out there. And I think the uh, Leah Bernard, the uh, Deputy Governor of the Federal Reserve, uh, Fabio Panetta from the ECB, and a number of other central banks have been quite clear that they do not want to crowd out stable coins at the expense, you know, and just, just leave consumer with a choice of using CBDC. What they like to do is well designed and obviously within the proper guardrails and whoever great regulated stable coins do have a role and do coexist uh, given that uh, the idea is to encourage innovation fair competition and diversity in terms of payment options no thank you so much i mean i, I think that's very consistent with everything we've heard globally from regulators um yeah. you know for sure certainly in the us every time this is discussed it always is starting with i think there's room for both uh, private and uh, CBDCs it, it, overall in an ecosystem. Uh, Shima, I, I mentioned a moment ago that I thought I had a good question to follow up with you. Um, you know, you, you mentioned sort of, you know, constantly thinking about innovation um, in the space. And recently, um, MAS partnered with a number of sort of big players, private sector players in the space, JP Morgan, MarketNode, DPS, on something called Project Guardian, um, sort of using um, DeFi uh, on public blockchains. Can you talk a little bit about sort of that and maybe why it's important? And maybe we can sort of jump off a little bit to a broader conversation on, on DeFi with, with Grace and John as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, I mean, earlier before this question, I was just saying that uh, because we really look at the underlying technology, um, how blockchain can really contribute to this transformation of the future of finance. Um, so we actually have been doing various forms of experiments over um, past few years. Um, the first was actually with Project Ubin. I'm not sure if any of you in the audience might actually be familiar or have participated before. It's a multi-year project starting back in 2016. So at that time, we also partnered with uh, industry players to explore uh, the use of DLT for clearing and settlement of uh, payments and securities. Um, so, and then uh, in a more recent example, there is also Project Dumba. So that was an initiative that was led by uh, BIS Innovation Hub together with uh, other central banks and MES, focusing on the use of multi-CBDCs uh, to the earlier topic, actually to transact and perform international settlement on the shared platform. So, you know, we have done various experiments and Project Guardian most recently announced is actually another one of this to push different frontier experiments uh, experiment and test out different aspects of the applications. And um, this time around, what we want to really test is the feasibility of applications in asset tokenization and DeFi. Um, why tokenization and why our interest in that is really, we see tokenization well, as the ability to allow high value financial and real economy assets to be fractionalized and then um, for it to be exchanged on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, right? So the interest is really to test the notion of whether this uh, could allow for greater liquidity, um, better price recovery, and also um, access, better access to illiquid assets. So if we can test out the hypothesis, it, it could have very interesting um, learnings for, the, uh, for how future of financial services could look like and what could financial market look like. So we use these experiments to deepen our understanding of this space, we don't know better, so we partner with industries to do that. And also importantly, not only um, on the feasibility front for regulators, really then uh, how risk uh, could look like in this space. Um, what are the regulatory guardrails that might be needed? Uh, for instance, it could look different. Um, it could be through the DeFi protocols, right? So um, what we want to really see is whether then um, these applications are um, 
able to really demonstrate the benefits of um, how uh, improving how financial services can be delivered compared to what we see today. Um, and we are um, also looking at then eventually whether uh, it really could lead to greater efficiency, greater accessibility, greater affordability um, of financial services and the financial market. Of course, at the end, what we are also looking out for is all these without compromising um, financial stability and the integrity that we have in traditional markets today. That's very important. Um, so, uh, and I would say that for Project Guardian, uh, we just announced it. Uh, we are uh, welcoming interested parties with great ideas to share them with us. Uh, this is an open kind of call for um, initiatives. So uh, we're happy to uh, partner with industry on this front. That, that, that's fantastic. Kind of staying with DeFi for a moment, John. Um, our, actually, our last uh, TRM talks, we had Brian Yo from ADGM, the uh, Abu Dhabi Global Markets, that just literally like days before it put out a pretty extensive paper, I thought one of the more fulsome from a regulator on sort of how to regulate in the DeFi space. Um, sort of and, and any additional thoughts um, or any thoughts on, on DeFi and sort of how, whether Singapore or really globally, uh, you know, regulators are starting to think more about it. Yeah, I think the way to, to look at it, I mean, Singapore regulator, specifically MES, is obviously adopting a very uh, progressive uh, and, and uh, measured approach in terms of looking at the activities based regulation rather than entity based regulation. And I think, uh, on the back of what Shimin mentioned, I think what they also look at is also proportionate, uh, proportionate treatment in terms of regulation rather than uh, sort of a blanket approach with respect to regulation. And I think one of the things to highlight, and I think in the, in the recent speech by the uh, Ravi Menon, which is the CEO or chief uh, MES, uh, he highlighted that, you know, in the context of, of fostering innovation and, and the tokenization, the, the promise of tokenization, where it creates efficiency uh, and also uh, the future state of digitization, Web3 and, and potentially metaverse, when we get to that stage, is to basically use this what we call sandbox sort of approach to look at how far and, and how resilient uh, some of these ecosystem could develop and foster. But at the same time, this is what we call the digital assets capability. Project Guardian and Project Dunbar is, is two of examples where they get a couple of private and public sector together, look at the ecosystem. Is it a conducive environment to, to clarify in terms of, you know, does this promise of technology or the types of digital assets able to sort of achieve the kinds of promise it's, 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 it's supposed to achieve. What risk do you run, whether smart contract risk, uh, you know, uh, contract cybersecurity risk, and also they use that to clarify, uh, you know, the, the sort of potential in blockchain, as you know, in blockchain, we talk about blockchain as, 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 as something that's so innovative, but as we know, we currently have scalability issues. That's why we have layer two. You have a lot of other things with smart contract risk, you know, cyber risk, hacking risk that, that, over time, it gets better. But at the same time, the MAS is also a very cognizant of the fact that risk has to be managed in order for this digital assets ecosystem to flourish. For example, they have highlighted four major risks that are watching closely. First of all, as we talked about earlier, the money laundering and, and terrorism financing risks, technology and cyber risks, and, and obviously the financial stability and consumer protections are key. Because without managing those risks we highlighted, it's not going to be sustainable. If you look what happened with Terra, US dollars and Luna, there's obviously a, 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 a sort of a credibility and a trust issue right now, right? So I think in order for, for you know, financials, you know, the, the types of activity to flourish, resilience, consumer protection, financial stability and trust is key. So I, I think that's, that's, uh, that's important. Now, coming back to how do you regulate DeFi and, 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 uh, the intersection between central finance, CFI, and DeFi, it's, it's a challenging one, right? So I was involved this week in a, a cyber sprint uh, at the UK FCA's cyber sprint with a number of professionals and private and public sector to look at what sort of areas in terms of the best regulatory approach. And there's no one size fit all. How do we re regulate DeFi? Do you regulate in the context of DeFi that are constitute as a decentralized autonomous organization? Do you regulate the DAO? And what do you regulate and who do you want to regulate? And, and obviously, these are not simple questions that, that, that have simple solutions. I think it requires a bit of approach. Are you looking at consumer protection? Um, you know, what are the touch points in terms of regulations? 
as we speak now, I think people are now realizing that the space where you talk about complete decentralized, it's not really uh, completely decentralized. You know, before you move to a complete DeFi, they got to be an issuer, they got to be a principal actor. And I think increasingly regulators are looking at those touch points. If you're going to bring products and services to the mass public, you got to make sure that there's proper governance. You also got to make sure there's proper accountability. These are areas that are obviously the FSB together with the BIS and the G20 are looking at very, very closely. In fact, it's in the G7 sort of communication that this is an area of international collaboration to look at what areas do you regulate? Because as you know, in terms of the DeFi space, stable coins is key. Stable coin, smart contracts, and oracles are areas of vulnerabilities that would need to be addressed. As we talk about stable coins, there are issues with respect to convert convertibility, transparency, redeemability, and the issue of contagion risk. How do you ensure that's being done? Now, at its conceptual level, you know, regulators are looking at, do we come up with audit standards in terms of looking at different types of DeFi? Because not all DeFi's are the same. And obviously, um, as, as we talk about in terms of stable coins, not all stable coins uh, have the same risk profile. And I think it's important to make sure that there's greater transparency and obviously certain minimum standards if they want to call it stable, stable coins. And I think these are obviously policy questions that need to be thought of in collaboration with international setting bodies and also between the private and public sector. I think it's key is to engage both the public and private sector. And MES will be very clear that when, whenever they came out with new regulations, it will adopt an adaptive, evolving, and a consultative approach. So in, in that respect, I would say MES is, is kind of progressive in that they are cognizant of the fact that this is a space that is fast evolving, but at the same time, we can't set rules that future-proof innovation. We just can't, because innovation can come in many ways, but is to be able to have adaptive, nimble regulations that tackle and address the risk that is currently posed. John, that's that's really that, that's an awesome answer, and it's really a crazy question that I asked. How do you regulate DeFi with five minutes left? By the way, that could that could have been an entire other uh, session. You did you did a great job. Uh, we're going to do a really rapid fire sort of closing here, uh, busting out the crystal ball. Sort of what's next, top of mind. What are sort of the stable coin issues of of tomorrow you know that regulators will be really focused on grace why don't i uh why don't i start with you um sure so um i would say that um i think uh definitely market conduct so i started off with more of a enforcement market manipulation background so i think i always have market integrity issues in mind to be honest so i think definitely regulators will actually move towards focusing on these issues we already see um a trends of that especially in the us as you see um you know the cftc focusing on a lot of these issues in their discussions i think gradually a lot of the regulators in other jurisdictions will also grow to focus on these issues as well fantastic uh shimin Uh, yeah, I, I think John really covered the ground so well. I'm not sure whether I can value add much, but um, he uh, essentially, so when we look at this space and um, when we look at um, DeFi being an open um, crypto networks, I think what um, to us uh, is obvious is at this stage, clearly they are not able to meet high standards of, of uh, governance, security, resilience, um, there are really unsavory practices like flash phones, attacks, you know, which we don't want to see. Um, so uh, the decentralized governance point that John made was exactly, you know, like who do you approach when we want to recover lost accounts, uh, lost funds? Um, these are issues that we are thinking through. And I think um, maybe kind of like just make a point that um, uh, today's regulations have been crafted to manage risk in a world of intermediaries. That's the world that we know. So as much as all regulators try to um, have a tech neutral approach, same risk, um, same rules type of approach, uh, we have to be cognizant of the fact that how our regulations are being set up today actually would have some technical difficulties to be applied neatly um, in a world where intermediaries are replaced by smart contracts. Um, and then let alone enforcement is going to be even more challenging. Absolutely. Um, so um, I would bring back to Project Guardian. We, 
we want to look at how it can maybe you know help us explore how the gut wheels could look like in this space. No, that's really that's really well said. In fact, someone asked on the chat how to get involved, and I imagine it's to reach out to MAS um, if you're a fintech interested in getting involved in this. <laughs> um, John, really uh, super yes, quick, yes. Uh, uh, sort of uh, what's next? What's sort of top of mind for you when it's when you're thinking about sort of what regulators are going to be digging in six months from now, a year from now, sort of down the road? Yeah, I think key to this is. Um, the capital and prudential requirements. I think the, it's very clear that uh, we will have the second consultation of the prudential requirements uh, in the next within the next month. Uh, that is, has been messaged quite clearly uh, in the public statement that we see in the DIS and Basel. So I think we do expect to see uh, whether how certain types of crypto assets are being um, treated from a capital and prudential perspective, because that will also drive whether you're going to have encourage wider adoption of this ecosystem by regulated financial institution. Because if, if the capital requirements are punitive, it's gonna be quite challenging for the uh, sort of regulated institution to participate given the uh, cost of capital and, and the, uh, you know, the you know the regulations that, that, that it brought to bear. The other thing very quickly, the FSB uh, is also looking at the crypto regulations around the world uh, and the major currency and major economies mm -hmm looking at whether there's also regulatory arbitrage or gaps that need to be plucked. Because as you know, crypto or digital assets is global. At the same time, what they do not want to encourage is, is a race to the bottom or regulatory arbitrage setting shops in, in, in a sort of lightly regulated entity where they, they conduct uh, sort of regulations. I think, I think the other thing that's important is also under the Biden administration, um, they are about to issue a future digital money paper. This is one of the five uh, papers that uh, they're, they're looking at. So the future money and, and payments will look at uh, the US CBDCs. Um, this is obviously separate from the Fed consultation. They're also going to look at financial stability risks, uh, review on illicit finance. Last but not least, also a report uh, on the global cooperation framework for digital assets. So US Treasuries are looking at five of these reports and will be releasing them in a series in the, in the next couple of months. Um, there obviously, there's plenty of space. Uh, we are also working with World Economic Forum, uh, where they're also looking at mapping uh, digital currencies regulations and coming out with a couple of recommendations. So watch the space. The, there will be a report out due in Q3 and Q4. John, thank you so much. And, and thank you so much. This was an amazing session. I'm going to have you each promise me that you're going to come back where we can really dig into like maybe one of these of these issues, <laughs> DeFi, stable coins. I mean, there's so much to discuss here. So really so grateful to have you join us and just for an amazing, amazing conversation. Um, thank you all uh, so much. And um, you know, thank you. Thank you to the audience. We had a, an unbelievable turnout, not surprisingly, with this panel today. So thank you all. Uh, so much for joining us. If you want to stay up to date on this nonstop, uh, you know, crypto content coming out of TRM, just subscribe to our newsletter, the weekly roundup, follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter, and stay tuned for next month TRM talks. I'm going to do a spoiler alert only for this group. Now, we're going to be talking about the keys to crypto compliance on June 23rd. So stay, uh, stay tuned for that. And uh, until then, thank you to the panel. And uh, and thank you all, um, you know, uh, all of you for helping us build a safer financial system uh, for billions of people. Uh, we will uh, we'll look forward to having you on again soon.